Well, 500 years ago, the church experienced an awakening that we call the Reformation. Uh, there were many voices involved in this, many people who rose up to say one thing or another in this time uh, and speak into a difficult moment in church history. Um, one of the many themes that stood out but really rose above the rest is justification. Uh, that is, how are we saved, essentially. And so we're going to take the next five weeks and look at that issue uh, and, and through the sort of the, the lens of the Reformation. Um, and so in justification, we're put right with Christ. It's, it's really the issue of salvation. Uh, 500 years ago, this was a very pronounced question. We're heirs to what happened 500 years ago today. Uh, we are a denomination that comes out of the Lutheran Church, uh, which, of course, is one of the parts of the Reformation that kind of split off from the Roman Catholic Church at that time. So we're clearly uh, heirs to this. Let's, Ashley, can you show this family tree that's here? You can't see it very well because it's very small type, but I'll point out that all these slides are always on the website by Monday, so you can go on there and look at this. Uh, you can see you are here off to the right side of the tree. Um, a lot of uh, splitting happened after uh, 1517, basically 500 years ago, uh, and answering these questions. We're part of that. We're, we're heirs to what happened uh, in one way or another. We're going to spend time specifically looking at the issue of justification, uh, which can be used interchangeably with righteousness. I'll use both terms. We're going to look at faith and belief, which can be used interchangeably, and both of these do get used interchangeably in Romans, which is going to be really the way we look at this, although we'll step to the side and look at Psalms next week, just because we can. But we're going to have some historical moments in this, um, and I know for some of you, you're going to sit up a little higher and take note, and for others of you, you're going to use your neighbor's shoulder as a pillow during those moments. Uh, just don't drool. But there's going to be some history, but let me just point this out. I have a master's degree in church history. I love history, but I'm called to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. So I'm preaching the word, even if I give you history. Okay. We're going to use it as, as a way to enter into that, but we're going to preach the word and hear from the word. So we're going to be in Romans 1 today. We're only going to look at two verses, 16 and 17. But I will give you some historical context to get there this morning. So let's start with this history, and let's go all the way back to the beginning. 30 A.D., give or take, is roughly the time frame for when Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Thanks be to God that that happened, that Jesus rose again for you and for me, so that we could have this justification, this righteousness. In 49 A.D., you have your first sort of pronounced moment where there could be division that happens in the church. That's the council at Jerusalem, where they have to distinguish uh, what does it look like to be a Jesus follower? Do we have to be distinctly Jewish in all the ways that we were before, or is there something different in how Jesus fulfilled the law as we move forward? And so the long and short of it is that the Council of Jerusalem in 49 AD uh, basically came to the conclusion in that wonderful church letter that indeed you don't have to be Jewish in the way we understood it. Something different has happened when Jesus fulfilled the law. There are certain things that we will do going forward. But, but to be this unified people, it's going to look a little different at this point. Same faith, same continuity with God's covenant through the Old Testament. It's just going to look different. Another point at which we have a potential moment of division, and there are lots of them, uh, but 325 A.D., the Council, the first Council of Nicaea, which inaugurates the first of seven what we call ecumenical councils. At that moment, they're trying to figure out what's the orthodox faith because there are challenges to what's orthodox concerning Jesus and, and the person of Jesus Christ. And so they convene this council. There are seven of those that take place in order to determine what is orthodox faith as they have challenges to what orthodoxy looks like. And by the seventh one in 787, it's the second council of Nicaea, that ends up, without anybody's knowledge, becoming the last truly ecumenical council. Um, and, and some people joke the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, it, their theology ended in 787, which is not really the case, but they lament deeply that there have not been any other truly ecumenical uh, councils since then. But these were all ways to stave off division within the church. And certainly people broke away and there were divisions that happened, but it was to try and maintain orthodoxy. The big one comes in 1054 AD, where you have, and when we talk Eastern and Western church, what you have is Europe 
largely comprising uh, the East or the Western Church, Latin speaking, Latin thinking. We're heirs to that. And then you have the Eastern Church, uh, which comprises kind of Egypt, the Middle East, Asia, and, and modern day Turkey. So a little bit of Europe, not much of it. They're Greek thinking, Greek speaking. And there's a difference in how those two uh, work. And they were kind of growing apart for a long time. But finally, in the year 1054, you have this sort of official split that goes on when the Bishop of Rome, who would be, we know as the Pope, sends a bull of excommunication to the Bishop of Constantinople during church. The emissary walks in and puts it down saying, we're not going to share the table with you anymore. You're out of the church. And then they, in turn, sent one back. Uh, so this was a big division in 1054. They're not going to share at the table anymore, which essentially divides the church. Now, the division had been growing for a long time. That's when it came to a head. It's all lamentable. It really is. It all is. And the, one, the division we're talking about then happens in 1517. Uh, that's a spark, a major spark in the Reformation. There are lots of voices, but a major spark with Martin Luther when he puts his 95 theses out there for theological debate. And it gets way bigger than he probably ever assumed it would. Uh, it was uh, October 31st, 1517 is when this all happened. There are churches around the world now celebrating this. We're going to take a stab at just saying something about it here over the next five weeks. Martin Luther, uh, certainly a flawed individual. Uh, we should recognize that. Um, he was the right man for the right time, but not the first and not the only. We should point out, he, he comes at a particular moment in history where he, uh, some things were coming to a head. He had some advantages that maybe he didn't even realize at the time, although he utilizes them uh, as he figures it out, um, that allow his voice to be heard in this difficult moment. He, uh, a few, three of the things that I would point out that are pretty distinctly um, noteworthy about the time period is that the Pope that was in play, and, and Martin Luther's part of what we call the Roman Catholic Church, that's what he was in. That was the church in Europe. He's in Germany. That's where he is. The Pope in Rome uh, was, at this stage, the most corrupt Pope of the Middle Ages, for sure. One of the more corrupt there was. Uh, pope Leo X. Um, he had pretty much exhausted an overflowing uh, uh, amount. The bank account for the Vatican was overflowing at the time. He exhausted it in two years. Some giving to the poor, largely lavish living. That'll come to get him later, by the way, and fuel some of this. He was very corrupt in his ways and dealings. Uh, you have as well, uh, Martin Luther, as well as the Pope, are living in what we call the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which comprises modern Europe in many ways. Uh, it was a lot of small states gathered together under the religious authority of the Pope and under the civil authority of an emperor that they deemed over all these other heads of small states basically. And as historians point out, the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. It was this kind of scattered grouping of people trying to maintain this old legacy of Rome in some ways. Um, and, and so there was all this power grabbing that would go on, which also comes into play here between different leaders. They wanted more land and more stuff to have and more money and all that. They were greedy at times. The third thing that comes into play that's pivotal in all this is the development of the printing press. It was growing and, and had come to fruition in the 1400s. And by the time of Martin Luther, it's, it's kind of working and, and starting to be used, but not in any major way in, in Germany until Martin Luther really comes to the forefront. So let's just look at what Martin Luther's issue was, and it'll lead us to Romans here. Um, he was a monk. He was an Augustinian monk. That's neither here nor there probably for most of us. That's just the order he was in. He was trained to be a lawyer, and his, his father really took him a long time to forgive Martin Luther uh, because he, he switched to becoming a monk after years and years of training to be uh, a lawyer. Um, that was not the desired outcome. But he was a very smart man. He got a, doctor in, a doctorate in theology, so he was a teacher of theology. And he was teaching when he put up his 95 theses, uh, which were posted in Latin. They were also mailed out in Latin. Um, and it was specifically intended for academic debate. What we should know is that uh, if you know the history uh, at all of Martin Luther, he actually tacked 97 theses up uh, not that long before that on some different issues and thought these are going to be great for scholarly debate. Their people are going to come and hear this. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to discuss theology and virtually nobody came to this thing. So when he puts up his 95 theses, he's thinking the same thing will happen. Not much right? This will be a scholarly debate. Not a whole lot's going to happen. 
Um, and what he's really attacking are these things called indulgences. Now, I want to get this right as I explain indulgences, uh, because what he's attacking is indulgences and also the abuse of the indulgences. Um, and so indulgences themselves um, were being sold from the Crusades on, so the early, or kind of mid-Middle Ages, 1,000, uh, year, uh, 1,100 or so and on. Um, and the belief in the church was that Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross covered our guilt, but there was still punishment that needed to be taken care of. So you have the idea of penance that, that comes out of that. That you need to somehow expiate the sin or get, get the punishment out of there. Indulgences were a way that somebody could utilize relics or pilgrimages or other means in order to help expiate the sin in this life. To get, get the punishment out. The guilt couldn't be taken care of. That's Jesus Christ. But the punishment needed to be taken care of. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the ins and outs of the theology of that because there's a lot I don't agree with in that. But the issue for Martin Luther is not simply the indulgences, but the fact that at his time, they're not just there, but they're being wildly abused uh, in order to raise money. So what's happening, I told you about the Holy Roman Empire, these little states, Albert of Brandenburg, this ruler in his re near his region had a couple regions that he owned, and he wanted a third. And he worked with Pope Leo X that if they sold indulgences in these German states, so that's far from Rome, that Pope Leo could get half the money and Albert could get half the money and then Pope Leo would give Albert this uh, area. And Pope Leo X, what he really wanted the money for, because he gave, you know, used all his money in lavish living, he wanted to build, finish building St. Peter's uh, Basilica, the church that stands there today, St. Peter's in Rome. That's what they were building at the time. And so they got this guy and his salesman, this Dominican uh, monk named uh, Johann or John Tetzel, to go around and sell indulgences. And he just told flat out lies, is what he did to sell them, and so did his salesman. So my favorite, one of my favorite historians, uh, Justo Gonzalez, says, John Tetzel was an unscrupulous man who was willing to make scandalous claims for his wares as long as such claims would help sales. Salesmen, right? Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, you guys are not quite with me. Let's, occasionally I'll tell a joke, you can laugh. It's okay. But what he said was, um, as he went around, his salesman said things like this. If you buy these indulgences, you know, so these are people paying money, and often people who don't have a lot of money paying money, uh, he said, uh, when they're sold to the sinner, they'll make you cleaner than when coming out of baptism. They'll make you cleaner than Adam before the fall. That the cross of the seller of indulgences has as much power as the cross of Christ. And most famously, as soon as the coin and the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Right? And that was the idea that you'd have to you'd expend uh, the amount of, of merit you could make in this life. You'd have to go to purgatory. In purgatory, you could finish that expiation go to be in heaven. Well, they believed that the saints and Jesus had given us more merit than they needed, and so it's available through the church to be sold through these indulgences. That's all that's going on. That really angered Luther. So he writes these theses in German, or in, in Latin, excuse me. They get sent to Albert of Brandenburg, who then says, wait a minute, this is going to mess with the money. He sends it to the Pope, who says, wait a minute, this is going to mess with the money. And they come after Luther. So this becomes a big thing very quickly. Luther messed with the money. It wasn't the theology that was the problem at this point. It was the money that was the issue. He was messing with an awful lot of money. And it got printed in the printing presses, not just in Latin, but in German. So everybody's reading these things now, too, because it got so popular. So Luther is, is really in for it by this point. He's not the only one, as I said, calling for reform. Uh, he wasn't calling for it in, in uh, he was calling for it in a different way than perhaps others were. He was calling for this specific thing at this point to be fixed. And Luther's goal was not to break from the church. He was, he was trying to reform the church. He's part of the church. He's trying to fix what he saw as corruption. And so what I want to point out is that while we talk about this over the next few weeks, we're heirs of this. And I'm rather thankful for some of the things that were highlighted and some of the ways that they've been answered because we stand in a tradition that follows some of those answers that are different. But one thing we should recognize, uh, you know, the church has been good at course correcting over the centuries. And this was a pretty significant course correction, but it caused a lot of division. Church, we should never be cavalier about disunity. We, we just talked about it for three weeks out of Ephesians. We're going to talk about it again. This was a moment of disunity. It was a difficult moment of disunity. We should never be cavalier about that. 
We should be seeking unity still, not sacrificing theology, but we should look for unity still as God's people. Let's go to Romans, though, because Luther's spiritual journey led him to Romans. We're going to go to Romans 1, starting at verse 16. And when he, he got to, Romans was really, he felt bondage is the easy way to put it. He never felt freedom in those days as a monk. That's why he was trying to be a monk. He was trying to experience this freedom. It just wasn't coming. He was, he was doing everything to get it. And it was when he finally came to Romans 1, 16 and 17 that he found it. And so I want to look at that passage, and I want to point out, here, here's what we should see, is that righteousness is a gift. That righteousness is relational, and that God wants a right relationship with you and me. We should see that in the text. So Romans 1.16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Why would Paul be ashamed of the gospel? Why would he even need to say it as we read this? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says. He clearly proclaims it. This, this by the way, 16 and 17 comprise the, the kind of the themes. He's setting up the themes of what he's going to say in the book of Romans. They're encapsulated kind of in these two verses. What is there to be ashamed of? Well, Paul is writing to the church in Rome. That's very clear, and that we, we know that's the case in this letter. Rome is the big, powerful, authoritative capital of the big, powerful Roman Empire. They command everything. They control it all. Uh, and, and while there is supposed to be justice there, they're the authority through and through. If you're in or out, Rome is big and powerful. You don't challenge Rome. Well, what is the gospel? It's the proclamation that the salvation of everyone comes through Jesus, a Jewish man... Of course, God in human form, we believe, but, but to the Romans, it would look like a Jewish man from the edge of the empire, this powerful empire, from a rebellious people, from a backwater of that rebellious people, and a rebellious man himself who was given a criminal's death on the cross. Paul is writing to the people in Rome, to the people sitting there close to the ones in power. I'm not ashamed of this gospel that that's where salvation comes from, that that's how God chose to do it. The, the a compounding issue that might be there is that in 49 A.D., Paul writes this letter in 57, give or take, in 49 A.D., that's the same year as the council in Jerusalem, in Rome, the, Gentile, or the Jews, Jewish population, which was sizable in Rome, was expelled from Rome for a time, for a number of years. And that would have included any... Uh, messianic following Jews as well, early Christians in the Jewish community. So you have all of a sudden a church that was probably uh, comprised mostly of Jews with Gentiles coming in to now a gent it flipped, a Gentile-filled church with Jews coming back in. And so Paul has to write things like, remember, it's first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Let's not forget that the church doesn't just start 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. It was in continuity with the covenant God made with his people. And Gentiles were always to be included in that, but now it's expanded in a way we never expected. So let's not forget the process by which God brought this salvation as well. Let's keep unity here, he's pointing out. Paul says uh, that, that salvation it brings salvation to everyone who believes. What does that mean? There's a, uh, a good definition, I think, from Easton's Bible Dictionary on what faith or belief is. Uh, it says that faith, in general, is a persuasion of mind that a certain statement is true. So we believe it. Its primary idea is trust, and a thing is true and therefore worthy of trust. By the way, if you're ever looking for definitions as you're reading scripture, Easton's Bible Dictionary is free online. Use it. It's a wonderful resource. So faith is the pathway, Paul is telling us, because of what God has done, it becomes the pathway that we follow when we're put right with God. We'll get to the righteousness component in a moment. But it's the fruit of being right with God. That's what faith is. We, we, we see that something's true. In this case, we see that God is true to his word and putting us right. Then we follow. We're obedient because of that. We do what he asks. Martin Luther was struck by this, and, and when he writes about this in his famous work, the preface to the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, after reflecting on all this, he says of faith, he says, faith is a work of God in us, which changes us, and brings us to birth anew from God. 
It kills the old Adam, makes us completely different people in heart, mind, senses, and all our powers, and brings the Holy Spirit with it. What a living, creative, active, powerful thing is faith. It is impossible that faith ever stop doing good. Faith doesn't ask whether good works are to be done, but before it is asked, it has done them. It is always active. Whoever doesn't do such works is without faith. He gropes and searches about him for faith and good works, but doesn't know what faith or good works are. And that's what Luther did. He groped around for this, as he says, looking for a way to save himself, ultimately, when it's offered there for him. And faith is the pathway once we've discovered that. The good works aren't going to be a matter of should I, it's we're going to do them because of our response to God's making us right. Now if we go on to verse 17, we can see more about uh, the gospel and righteousness and the connection there. Paul writes, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall, will live by faith. If you're looking for how Paul kind of defines gospel, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, verses or two through five, you can kind of find a working understanding of what Paul means by gospel. He, of course, defines it throughout. Um, and small groups, you're going to be looking at that this week. But essentially, the gospel is God's good news. But what does that mean? He's saying that it's the righteousness of God. It's the fact that we're made righteous by God's work. That's the good news, at least the beginning of it. Not that we can attain it on our own. That's not the good news. That's bad news. The good news is that God, through Jesus Christ, made us righteous for those who believe. And, and that idea of justification or righteousness, you can use both terms. It's a judicial term, especially when you use justification. A judicial idea or forensic idea that the law is fulfilled. It's not set aside. It's not, it's not uh, ignored in the process but that the law is fulfilled. So it's as if we were following the law. That's what God has done, even though we weren't. Whether we know it or not, we've stepped far from God and what God wants and desires. Uh, and so that needs to be taken care of. We need to be put right. So we're put right through God's work through Jesus Christ for us. And basically, our sin account, if you will, was in the negative, And we never could have repaid it. And God says, I'm going to put it at zero. But he doesn't just put it at zero. That's the thing. We're not just, when we're made right with God through Jesus Christ and we, we believe this salvation that's given to us, it's not simply that. There's more to it. When we're made righteous, we get the full benefits and advantages of as if we were following the law of God's very presence and what comes with that. So if you put it all together, in justification or in righteousness, we're made right with God. And then faith, Paul says, is how we proceed from that point forward. We trust that God is true to his word and will be. And we're going to follow accordingly in close proximity to God and God's will and ways. Righteousness, it turns out, is a gift made possible by Jesus Christ. And, and there are two significant things that we could point out among many uh, that, that we could see within that righteousness or how it's brought about and what it means for us. The first is this, and this is where a lot of people uh, remain, and you can't just remain here, but it's important, is that in Jesus Christ, both before the death and resurrection and after, in Jesus before and after, we see what life is supposed to be like. Before the resurrection, we see a model of what we're supposed to be like if we're going to be in obedience to God. We can see that in Jesus Christ, so we need to understand him and imitate who he is. In the resurrected Jesus, we see what is to become for those who are saved, for those who are, are made right with God, and what the resurrected body is going to look like. Jesus shows us that. So we have an example to be imitated. A lot of people leave their understanding of salvation at that point, though. It's crucial to have that, but that's not the whole story, just so we're clear. There is an example to be imitated. But what God does through Jesus Christ is actually change something in us. Not just give us an external example to, to look at and to view, and Jesus is a good moral teacher, or my good works will get me there. But there is a God-ordained inner transformation that takes place because of what Jesus Christ did. That's how we can be made right with the law. Be put right in obedience, basically, as if we were following the law, and get those full benefits. And Jesus, we're changed so we can experience the life that Jesus shows us. 
Not so we can just imitate and struggle along. We can actually have that life today and at the resurrection. And Paul says as much in the book of 1 Corinthians 15. At verse 22, he says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all be made alive. That is, we could follow in the way that God intended, and we can even see that in the life of Jesus. It, it's the second Adam. It, it'll look like what we should be. But if we're not in Christ, we're going to still follow the path of Adam. We've got to be in Christ. There's got to be something that changes in us. He says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. then when he comes, those who belong to him, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. That's what's supposed to happen. It's not simply an imitation. We get that. That's good. But an inner transformation that takes place, that sets us right with God. Now, when Luther read Romans 1, 16 and 17... He eventually, it took him a while, he eventually saw freedom there. Now, he was a monk, so he knew the Psalms by heart. If you've ever gone and prayed with monks, even today, what do they do? They sing and pray the Psalms over and over and over again. It's a wonderful thing. So he knew the Psalms, forward and backward. He taught the Psalms as a theology professor. He prayed, he studied, he confessed, he had a spiritual director, he did penance, he did hard penance at times, crazy penance at times, to try and work out the sin that held him down. And all the work he was doing continued to lead him to bondage, not freedom, he felt. It just never was enough. And he felt like he was set up for failure from the beginning. He had a hard existence, his parents were harsh. Uh, His teachers were harsh. He got beaten a lot in school because he didn't do his work. He suffered from anxiety and depression. He never felt like he could satisfy and do enough. He always felt held down. And he wanted to love God. That's why he became a monk. He wanted to love God and do right and experience that love that came came with God. But he actually realized that in all this work, his impression of God... Uh, became one where he didn't love God, he, he actually realized he probably hated God, or at least the God he thought he knew. And really what's fascinating is what changed is his spiritual director said, why don't you go teach? You're, you're at this difficult, low spiritual level. Why don't you go teach at the new University of Wittenberg? And he went and taught the Psalms, which were restorative for him. And then he got to Romans. And if you read what he writes about Romans, he said it's the full gospel. Right there. That's what I needed to hear. It was the full gospel. And he got to Romans 1, 16 and 17, and he had some realizations uh, of what that meant, that he couldn't work his way to God. God had already done the work, and it brought freedom. I'd like to point out, when we're at those points, when we're at those lows, like Luther was, do you notice it's interesting what is it the advice was? It wasn't, why don't you pull back and why don't you take a retreat and why don't you sit, why don't you give the scripture a rest and maybe give church a rest? You know, some people do that. They think, well, I'm trying to figure out who I am. I'm going to give that a rest. I'm having a hard time. No, he dug in. He dug in and that's where he found the answer. And that's what we're supposed to, that's what we need to do when it gets hard, dig in to God's people and to God's word and to God's presence. And that's what he did and that's where he found the change. Luther had to really work hard on getting a right view of God and of Jesus' work on the cross. But he found freedom when he did. And it's it's the freedom that when we believe we are set right with God from that moment. That's what justification, that's what righteousness is, that we are made right with God. And so as we read Romans 1, 16 and 17, we should discover those things that Luther heard as well, that righteousness is a gift. To be set right with God. Righteousness is a gift. There's, there's no, no one can earn what God has freely given. Because God's giving it freely. You can't earn it. It can't be bought. And you couldn't afford it anyways. Righteousness is relational. It's not just that the law is broken. It's that we've broken relationship with God. That's what's being repaired. It's not just fulfilling the requirements of the law. And now you've done that. Go on your way. It's that God says, I want to restore the relationship that's been broken by sin. That's what's happening in that righteousness, to be made right with our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And finally, God wants a relationship with you, which is clear throughout the whole of Scripture, but comes clear in this point. 
that God was not in opposition, Luther discovered, to who he was. God was not setting him up for failure. God wanted a full and fulfilling relationship with Martin Luther, and he wants it with you and me as well. It extends to all of us who are created in the image of God and for whom Christ died. That's what God wants for us. That's what uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17 is saying. And so here's the good news. You're not good enough. You're not good enough on your own, and you never will be to earn God's love and favor. Doesn't sound like good news right away, does it? Here's the good news. God already gave you the chance to be in his presence. He gave you success and freedom. Salvation that's available today, and it begins by accepting God's reality for you that you can be made right with God because he wants it. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Savior, we thank you today and we invite you into this place that you would change us, not just give us an example to follow, but give us the inner transformation, that we'd be transformed in heart, mind, and soul. That we'd be different because you've set us right. And for those of us who are sitting here who have never set ourselves right in your presence and never made ourselves right accepting your salvation, not because of our works, God, let us have the chance right now. If you've never put yourself right with God through Jesus Christ right now, just say, God, I believe. And Jesus Christ, forgive my sins. That I can walk forward in faith with you. God, may we continue to be your witnesses of your goodness in our lives, that we can feel and show both the freedom that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Will you help us not just to reduce the relationship we have to you, with you, just to rights and wrongs, but to being with you in your presence and with your people who love you. Father, may we be the face of your good news because of that this morning. Will you change us? pray this all in the name of your Son. Amen.